All right, well, let's get this party started. Thank you all for attending the uh, May Cybersecurity Meetup. Uh, we do these things monthly, and um, they seem to be well-received. A lot of uh, folks sign up for it and uh, either attend or uh, get their uh, information later as we distribute the recording. We also post the uh, recording online on our uh, website. Uh, we have a YouTube page that you can uh, get to by just going to the website, and they'll have all of our uh, previous uh, cybersecurity meetups, as well as any other content that we generate. So feel free to go there. Uh, I am Luis Alvarez, President and CEO of the Alvarez Technology Group. And with me, I have my uh, co-host, uh, our Chief Security Officer, Jeff Dix, and our Senior uh, Cybersecurity Analyst and uh, Consultant, Anil Melwani. So welcome, gents. Uh, Good morning. We, welcome. Good morning, everyone. We are excited about uh, today's webinar because we're going to be talking about um, a subject that uh, many of you are going to be impacted by. I know a lot of our clients are being impacted by it, and that is the new Federal Trade Commission safeguards rule that go into effect uh, next month, June 9th, to be specific. I don't know why they picked June 9th. Why can't they pick the 1st or the, the 15th? It's some random day, but exactly. Yeah, exactly. But no, that's that's the federal government. We're going to just pick some random day in the middle of, of the month, and this is what it is. So um, what is the FTC safeguard rule? Uh, basically, this rule has been in effect for a number of years. There, It's not new. It's been around for uh, over uh, 30 years. But um, last year, the uh, FTC decided that it needed some updating because the world has changed a little bit uh, over the last uh, few years. And the safeguard rule is designed to protect customer information and customer data that companies collect and store on their systems. And obviously the, the methods and, and ways that that um, is done today is vastly different than it was when the uh, safeguard rule was originally created. So they updated them last year. Um, and then decided to postpone implementation for about six months um, while people got uh, used to it. So it, it actually was approved last year, but goes into effect in June. Um, and the other thing that changed about the rules, not only did they update some of the requirements, and we'll get into that, uh, but they also uh, changed who is uh, required to adhere to these rules. Uh, originally, the, the rules impacted mostly financial companies. So, you know, think of um, mortgage brokers or um, uh, lenders, uh, finance companies and non-federally insured credit unions. But now the term financial institution, which is what um, the FTC safeguard rule governs, includes things like car dealerships, uh, credit consulting companies, uh, tax preparation companies, uh, investment advisors, whether you're registered with the SEC or not, um, real estate companies. Uh, and there's more on that list and included, for example, I found this one kind of interesting, is um, if you are a an organization that provides training to uh, people who go on to financial careers. So think of a training center or a career uh, center that trains uh, people in bookkeeping or in um, accounting. You are required by the FTC to follow the safeguard rule because you are considered a financial institution. So it's a very broad rule and uh, has implications across um, the spectrum for a lot of companies that uh, may have in the past not been um, impacted by this. Um, did I miss anything about that before we dive into the uh, the nitty gritty of, of what the rule covers in the older Jeff? Yeah, you know, I was actually reading one this morning that was interesting about um, temp agencies being under that too, because there are quite a few accounting specific uh, temp agencies uh, in the industry that are, you know, just providing temporary employees to do, you know, bookkeeping or payroll or just to, you know, come in and help with ARAP. So those uh, temp agencies fall under the FTC safeguards rule as well. Yeah, yeah or organizations like collection agencies as well. And I think a, a lot of organizations are going to be surprised when they find out that they're going to be fall under the new guidance of this rule. So it's a lot of a lot of organizations that have not traditionally been thought of as financial organizations are going to fall under this rule. 
And, you know, one of the questions that I've gotten from people who now fall under this rule is, well, why should I care? I mean, quite honestly, what is the FTC going to be doing? Are they going to send, in, send out, you know, folks to knock on my door and inspect my books and, and make sure that I'm following the rules? You know, is there any sort of, you know, follow up from them? If they don't do what I'm supposed to do, am I going to get in trouble? And um, Jeff, you had a really good answer to that uh, when we were talking about this earlier. So what happens if somebody doesn't follow the rules? Well, uh, it's, it's, it's not likely that you're going to get caught until uh, there's a, a breach event or if somebody else reports you. Uh, so it's like, like a lot of things where there's no enforcement, there's not very good uh, compliance and adherence to uh, the rule or the law. But if you get caught, uh, you can get fined up to $43,000 a day for noncompliance. And uh, most companies can't sustain that, even if they've got um, you know, good cyber insurance. A lot of cyber insurance companies are not going to cover uh, the, the loss of, of not following uh, the rules that were supposed to be being followed. So uh, it's likely that uh, you know, and if, if it gets uh, publicly released, and there's also the reputational damage that, that the mm -hmm. organization is going to suffer if it becomes publicly known and it hits the press. So uh, it's uh, best to, if you haven't gotten started, uh, to one, investigate whether you fall under the, the new rule so that you can get started with the program and move towards uh, adhering to what the FTC is going to require. Good point. Um, thank you, Neil, for reminding us that you can ask questions. There's a Q&A button. Feel free to, to use it and we will answer as many of those while we are live. If not, we'll get back to you via email or, or give you a call to follow up on any questions that we don't answer uh, during the, uh, the event. Um, and, and quite frankly, as we're going to go into the, what the FTC uh, safeguard rules require. But a lot of it, as we go through it, you'll recognize as basically good cyber hygiene. They're not asking you to go above and beyond, with the exception of a couple of things that are unique to the safeguard rule. But by and large, a lot of the uh, the things that are um, that are recommended or that are required to, to be in compliance are things that we require of our clients who are under our managed security services. So it's not that unusual. It's not out of the ordinary. Um, First and foremost, one of the things that is required before you do anything else is that you need to designate a qualified individual <laughs> to be the, you know, the 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 person who inf uh, oversees the program and the compliance, including the information security program. So what does that mean? Well, what it means is that you can't say, hey, John, you're the receptionist. Um, in addition to answering phones, you are now in charge of FTC safeguard rule compliance. <laughs> Have fun with that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty funny <laughs> yeah well you know it's it, it's interesting that some some folks you know because we've been in doing compliance for i don't know how many years two decades now helping customers with hipaa and 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 other um compliance related uh activities and in a lot of cases they think that it's when it's required that you would designate somebody as the, the primary point of contact for this stuff it's like well let's find the person that that is the least qualified to do this and assign it to them and make them do it because they have the time to do it. Whereas, you know, the reality is that this is something that this person is actually going to have to report uh, to uh, management, will have to report to um, the board of directors if the organization has one uh, on, on a regular basis on what the status of the, the information security plan is. Um, is and you know do you really want john the receptionist being your you know your go-to person for this this kind of thing so no. think about no you do not um typically it's going to be in, in a small business it may be the business owner uh him or herself um in a larger business it might be uh you might already have somebody who's responsible for compliance large org organizations have multiple things that they have to do to to be in compliance with different regulatory requirements so that this just adds to that person's uh tasking um or maybe somebody in the in the IT or finance department typically you know falls under the CFO or controller or somebody like that um so once you've designated the person the next thing that you need to do um is get a risk assessment. Um, and we're not talking about a checklist where you just go through and say, yep, 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 I'm doing all these things. You really need to go out and find a third party to do a risk assessment, a thorough analysis of where you're at, 
uh, relative to the requirements of the FTC so that they can present a discovery document with with a gap analysis. And so, guys, can you? I know you guys do this all the time. You're, you're, you do assessments uh, regularly. So uh, can you give us some insight into what that looks like and what it takes to, to get that done? Sure. The, the last assessment I did was for a local company here. It was a small organization, about 25 uh, users, 25 uh, Windows systems, and just a single server. I spent about a week on that, about 40 hours of labor to to go and uh, scan their network and identify vulnerabilities and get information from all their systems. So it's about a, a, a week's worth of effort. Uh, if uh, you know larger network is going to take more effort, uh, if you've got 100 workstations or 150 workstations, that's going to be substantially longer uh, engagement, probably three to four weeks in, in you know a larger network. Uh, the good news is is that the uh, the assessment tool that uh, that we use to do these assessments just added the FTC safeguard rules as a template uh, to uh, actually conduct the assessment. So we won't we won't we wouldn't have to collect other information that's outside of what the FTC is looking for now. So it, we may be able to pare it down a little bit, but uh, in, in general, I'd say for smaller networks, it's a week engagement. For larger networks, it's a t- uh, two to three week engagement or, or or more depending upon the size of the network yeah and on, on top of that obviously you know we do the the scanning and, and developing the gap analysis but there's also a good part of it that's you know interve- interviewing the, the key stakeholders in the company um to discuss with them you know what it is that their role is and what policies and procedures they already have and again being federal government you know they've got their standards and controls and that's what jeff was talking about in the template so it makes it really easy for us to come in and, and interview you and discuss where your your current cybersecurity posture is now and what it will take to get you across the finish line so that you are uh, compliant with the safeguards rule yeah because w- one of the requirements is you need to have an, a written information security program so basically you need to have documentation um, that shows what what is my program who's responsible who that key person is that we discussed earlier um what are the the things that i do you know on a monthly basis annual basis because these risk assessments aren't like a one and done thing right it's not like uh, the world doesn't keep on moving so if we did if we did a risk assessment um with a client a year ago uh and we redo it this year there are new risks there are new things that are out there that are um, you know, now going to be impacting that risk assessment that last year wouldn't have been an issue because it, they weren't around. So uh, a good example of of this is that um, the rule requires that you enable multi-factor authentication um, on any system uh, that that uh, uh, has that ability, but in particular email. Um, and Anil, why why is MFA for email so important? Well, you know, one of the biggest um, issues we see in cybersecurity is what we call business email compromise. And that's where, you know, the bad guys get your password, whether it be from the dark web or by, you know, brute forcing it or whatever it might be. And without a second layer of authentication, once they've got your username and password, they're, they're in your email. And they'll they'll just sit there and hide in there and watch what you're sending and receiving and doing until they they formulate the, their plan of attack on how they're gonna you know try and extort some money from you or or bring your systems down based on just by monitoring what's happening in your email. So a real great thing about multi-factor authentication is that even if they were able to either buy your um, password on the dark web, which I was just recently at a cybersecurity conference in Scottsdale, and the current price is seven dollars on the dark web for a valid username and password, seven bucks. And there you go. Um, and so either they're getting it from there or like I said, they're brute forcing it. You've just got, you know, your your favorite pet with a, with a number one and an exclamation mark after it, you know, the typical kind of passwords and people can guess those kinds of things all the time. So multi-factor authentication, very critical for email. And a, a requirement uh, as is encryption. Um, so, one of the things that's required is that all the information that you, sensitive information that you collect and maintain is encrypted. Um, and that means it's not only encrypted when it's sitting on a hard drive someplace, but it's also encrypted when it's in transit, uh, which means that if you're emailing documents, you need to have a, um, uh, a encryption system with your email that is um dependable and reliable and is used every time you you send something um and then also when you you know you have mobile systems a lot of people have 
laptops now and and have their cell phones and have uh, tablets. All of those systems, if they they can store um, sensitive information, needs to be encrypted. And that's uh, something that a lot of people don't really think about or don't really consider. Um, you know, if you have an iPhone, for example, you're in good shape because iPhones are are encrypted by default. Uh, if you have a Samsung phone like I do, because I'm a droid guy, I'm not a, a one of you iOS people, um, <laughs> you know, that Samsung has their Knox uh, uh, security encryption system in place and it's automatically uh, encrypted. But a lot of other phones aren't, you know, a lot of other phones, you have to enable that that uh, encryption or tablets, you have to enable that as well. So uh, something else to think about. Um, the uh, one of the other rules is that you really need to provide security training for all your staff. Um, and we're not saying you subscribe to it and put it on a bookshelf someplace or park it and say, yes, we have a security pro program in place. Nobody does it, but hey, we, we have it and we can check that box. Um, uh, Jeff, can you talk a little bit more about what a, a good uh, cybersecurity training program looks like? Uh, sure. Uh, well, for our clients, we we use an online training system, and what's great about that is we kind of set it up for them, and th then all we do is uh, email them training reports. So uh, usually the um, the curriculum changes uh, the first of the year uh, in January, and then we sort of start the the campaigns with our with our clients to get all their folks uh, trained up to the to the recent training. Uh, what's great about that is it's documented as they log in. Uh, it's a very minimal um, administrative effort for both us once they're set up and for the clients. And it keeps track of uh, who's done their training and who hasn't. Uh, in addition, it has uh, what, the, what they call micro trainings once a week, which are just uh, basic little topics like kind of a topics we cover here uh, on the meetup on, uh, you know, what is encryption? What is device encryption? What's a business email compromise? What's a ransomware event? What does that kind of look like? And so that's a regular, you know, takes five minutes a week. They could come out on Thursdays. And it's just a, a way to uh, raise the security awareness of the folks that work in your organization. And um, the, 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 the threat actors are, are targeting the end users now. They don't, they don't worry about trying to break in through the firewall. They know if they can get a phishing email to a user's desktop and they can get them to click on something or download something that's in that email, that that's how they're going to get access to the network. So it's super critical. It's one of the highest priorities for us is to make sure that our, our clients are getting their folks trained and monitoring their training and, and taking the training seriously. Also, um, cyber insurance companies are requiring that more and more. We're seeing more questions on our questionnaires we fill out for our clients. Uh, do you do you know regular cyber training for your end users? And if you can't say yes, uh, you may not get your insurance, your cyber insurance underwritten. Uh, and in a minimum, it'll be it'll cost you mo more if you're not. Uh, adhering to what uh, the, the insurance companies are requiring and now the FTC is requiring for people that fall under the, the new rules. Excellent. Um, the, another area, uh, and maybe Anil, you can speak to this, is, um, you know, the, one of the things that we find on, on networks is that most people don't do a good job of limiting access to sensitive information. You know, they pretty much make you know put all the customer information either in a, a you know publicly accessible place so all the employees can get to it uh, or they do things which you know sends shivers up and down my spine like sharing user ids and passwords or having you know, one common user id that everybody logs in on you know just because it's easier than trying to remember you know everybody's uh, or having everybody trying to remember their own user id and password so uh, what are some of the best practices for limiting and monitoring who can access sensitive customer information? Yeah, you know that's that's an important one because um, you know we always try to to practice the the you know least privilege. It's like you know you should only have enough access to do do your job and not more. And some of the things we see are like you're saying, you know, you've got a company share on your network, and you know, let's go back to to John, the receptionist. You know, he doesn't need access to the to the human resources or payroll folders or anything like that. But sometimes, you know, the clients or, or companies will just try to make things as quick and easy as possible to be convenient. Uh, and we all know that cybersecurity isn't necessarily convenient if we want to keep you safe and secure. Um, so don't just blanket give, you know 
open access to those folders to everybody in the company. Um, and then even more critical things like like you were talking about passwords and so forth, things like administrative rights. A, a user doesn't need administrative rights from their local machine. Um, and they can do 99.9% of everything they would need to do without administrative rights. And so if they did end up getting like a phishing email and accidentally click on uh, the link without realizing what it was, that can't actually do any damage to their computer because the user that's logged in doesn't have the ability to make the changes that that malware is trying to do. Um, and then, you know, heaven forbid you'd actually have like domain admin rights, which is what we call where you've got access across all your network or global admin rights in Office 365, where you've got full access to every mailbox in the Office 365 tenant, because um, that can be really dangerous. You know, if you accidentally get some really bad malware and you have global administrative rights or domain administrative rights, that's how ransomware can spread in a, in a blink of an eye. Yeah, okay, everywhere, everywhere in the network, servers everywhere. Um, w one other requirement is developing an incident response plan, which is something that most people don't even really think about, but is becoming a requirement not just for the FTC, but we're seeing this uh, even from cyber insurance companies now. They're requiring that uh, uh, some policies require that the companies develop a, a written or documented uh, incident response plan. Um, Jeff, what does that look like? Well, at a minimum, what they what they want to see in that is the definition or defining the roles for individuals in the company. Who's going to be the incident uh, response manager? Who's going to potentially talk to outside organizations, including the, the press? Uh, and there all then there also should be some general steps on uh, on what the uh, the organization, how the organization is going to respond. And what I mean by that is that um, if you are if you are smart enough to have cyber insurance, uh, one of the first steps is going to be uh, to call your cyber insurance company and make them aware of a possible or potential incident has occurred. And then uh, for for a lot of the response, uh, the insurance company will will direct what is to be done uh, by the current IT provider and by the organization it, itself. Um, for organizations that don't have cyber insurance, then they're going to need to to have some uh, definitely have more detail in a, in a process of uh, going through uh, a recovery. Um, and it doesn't have to be a super elaborate, especially when you're first getting started. But the defining the roles of who's going to do what within the organization and the role of the uh, IT provider and uh, the, the, the main numbers and the first few steps that, that need to happen in the process of recovery will hopefully reduce the stress of, of, that everybody's going through because it's very stressful to go through an incident, a malware incident, ransomware or otherwise. And it just kind of um, gets you started down the, the, the right proper path. Uh, for more elaborate plans, there definitely are tools out there, uh, online and non-online tools that can be uh, engaged to, uh, to develop an incident response plan. And the FTC does require what they say is a written. I think online is probably okay, but there has to be a formal plan that uh, is maintained by the organization. And then also you wanna practice uh, your response from time to time by running a tabletop exercise, which is basically uh, having a scenario of, a, of an event, say a ransomware event, and kind of working through the process of the documentation and engaging the individuals that have been identified uh, as uh, key role players in the incident and actually walk through your plan to make sure that that everybody's familiar with the plan and that uh, you haven't forgotten any any major steps that need to be, uh, be need to be done during an incident. Yeah, to me, you know, a lot of people would think, well, you know, it seems like a, a paperwork exercise. But honestly, when you think about it, when an incident does happen, let's say you have a data breach or you have a business email compromise, wouldn't it be nice to know, OK, we know what to do, right? We're, we're, not, we're not running around going, who do we call? What, you know, yeah, who should exactly. we tell? <laughs> you know, who, who's responsible for this? You know, who, who do we need to, to contact? You know, you, you have it documented. It's pretty easy. You just go through the, the plan. Like you said, it doesn't have to be super complicated. It just has to be something that, that um, makes sense for you as an organization and that works. Uh, yeah. And that's why testing is important so that you know that it works so that there's not a, a line item on there that says, you know, call this person and that person has, you know, is your attorney and they retired 10 years ago. And you're like, well, OK, well, <laughs> definitely we need to update yeah. the plan to the new yeah. attorney. 
<laughs> that's a good reason for like uh, doing an exercise once a year a tabletop and making sure that everything's still current in the, in the plan it doesn't have to be i mean to get started the sim- getting started simply with a simple plan is better than the no plan certainly and it can be enhanced over time as uh, everybody kind of gets used to the process you know one of the um one of the other requirements that i i find interesting because we're seeing this as well in other regulatory um uh, regimes, including cyber insurance companies, is uh, periodically assessing the security practices of service providers. So basically, we're talking about third parties that do work for you. You need to understand what they're doing uh, in order to secure their environments. And, you know, how's, um, how does that work? Yeah, so, um, you know, there's a, depending on, on the vendors that you're working with that may have access to any of the sensitive data or, you know, have access inside your network, I'll, I'll use healthcare as an example because they, they've kind of really developed it well over time. Uh, as a HIPAA regulation, you have to have a, a business associate agreement with any third party vendor. Um, but you can get those kinds of agreements. It doesn't have to be healthcare specific. You can have any third party that you work with from a janitorial service all the way up to a managed services, managed security service provider, and have them go through that due diligence and and provide you a report to show that they're also meeting the compliance requirements and the safeguards that are in place for your industry, not just for them, just in general for what they're doing, but specific for your industry. Well, and, and as we get uh, toward the end of the uh, uh, the uh, cybersecurity meetup here, I'm going to kind of condense something, uh, a couple of the the requirements into into one, and then have you guys comment on it as we uh, wrap up. Which is, um, they want us to or want you to design and implement safeguards to control any foreseeable internal and external risks to customer information. You need to regularly test and monitor the effectiveness of those safeguards, and then. Um, evaluate and adjust your information security program best based on the testing results and, um, you know, make sure that your your information security program actually takes into account uh, the, you know, the changing risks that are out there in the environment. So, um, Jeff, I'll start with you. You know, how, how does that work? Does this just kind of illustrate that, you know, cybersecurity is not a one and done thing, that this is an evolving, you know, beast that you need to feed and take care of on a, on a regular basis. Yeah, absolutely. To, to, to me, what that means is, is having the ability to understand exactly everything that's happening on your network, you know, or files being copied from the local network out to the Internet. Uh, organizations need to have uh, the capability to uh, to see that and to monitor that and to get alerted when something like that occurs. And uh, tip, so typically most networks don't have that kind of detailed logging or tracking or monitoring enabled uh, services on their networks. So uh, that, that's a good thing to, to understand is that if you want higher level security, you really want to understand what's going on and happening on your network. Uh, you have to have the tools and the monitoring capability in place to be able to, um, to, t- to detect those things early. I mean, you don't want to wait you know, three weeks and find out that, you know, a uh, hundred, hundred gigabytes or a hundred terabytes of data has been copied from your network out to the internet somewhere. You have to have tools in place to alert you to those types of events so that you can, you can keep them from happening or, or getting worse. Anil, anything uh, to add? Um, no, I, I think the only other thing to, to kind of iterate is that, you know, the FTC isn't going to come in and, and audit you for this kind of thing. Um, it's, you know, it's one of those situations where, uh, God forbid, something bad happens and you have to report it. And then if they find out that you haven't been meeting the safeguards, the fines can be quite substantial, um, like somewhere in the region of forty three thousand dollars per day if you if you've been kind of egregious with it. Um, but, you know, you could be it could be a customer, it could be a competitor, it could be an employee internally that's disgruntled. That's like, I know that you're that we're not doing this. That's part of the FTC safeguard rule. And I'm going to I'm going to call the anonymous hotline and, and send it out. So the sooner you can start start getting to the safeguards rule, the better. Um, and then just like any of these um, these federal compliancy things, you know, one of the the good news is, is that, you know, complying with it, although it may seem like it's daunting, you know, FTC has made it clear that companies that are starting to make the steps in the right direction will not be subject to those kinds of fines if there was something that came up. So, you know, it's really about the due diligence and really like taking the steps forward to get you to where you need to be. Don't feel like you need to, to eat that entire elephant in one sitting. 
Yeah, and and like we said earlier, the the two biggest steps is one, designate somebody to be in charge of the program, and two, get that risk assessment done. Exactly. Because that will show that you are in fact, you know, taking the steps in the right direction. Well, thank you both, gents. Uh, thank you all for attending. We are at the bottom of the hour, as promised. Um, we will uh, wrap up at this point and then uh, join us next week or next month in June for our next cybersecurity uh, meetup. Not sure what the topic is going to be, but I'm sure there's going to be something juicy to discuss. So <laughs> always uh, is. There always got a couple links to decide. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> hey, uh, just as a last minute, I, I put a link to the FTC site uh, for that organizations can go to to get more information about whether or not they fall under the rule and just what the rules are in general. So uh, copy that link and check that out if you feel like you guys are uh, going to fall under the rule. Other all than right. that. See you guys all next month. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, Have see a you guys great next month. Thank uh, you. Rest of your day.